Hello everybody. With this uh, video lecture, we're going to be moving into chapter three. And in uh, chapter three, we're going to cover some very basic information about bacterial structure. And um, the reason we're going to cover this, some of it might seem a little detailed at times, but uh, it's uh, an important chapter because all these little bacterial cell parts come up over and over again during the semester. And uh, now, of course, there are different types of microorganisms. Not all microorganisms are bacteria, and I want you guys to be sure you appreciate that right up front here in the course. However, as you guys know, many infectious diseases, which uh, that tends to be the focus in a microbiology class like this, where most of you guys are going into the health sciences in some capacity, many of the microorganisms that cause health problems are bacteria. So it's important for us to learn about all these different structures. Also, by the way, I am recording at home, and so many of you have probably never had me before for a video lecture. Some of you guys have for a &P, and if you had me in a &P, you know that when I record at home, I've got two dachshunds named Bert and Ernie, and they almost invariably like to start barking uncontrollably whenever I'm doing a video lecture at home. So if that happens, uh, just giving you a, a warning here up front. All right, so let's move on. Let's uh, first of all let's review some basic information about bacteria. What are bacteria? Some just basic characteristics. All right, first of all, bacteria fall into the prokaryotic cell category. Um, they're all unicellular, which is a fancy word for single-celled organisms. And remember, we have two cell types. We have prokaryotic cells and we have eukaryotic cells. And there are some uh, similarities between the two, but then there are some very important differences. And uh, lucky for us, there are some pretty big differences between the way bacterial cells, which are prokaryotic, are constructed versus the way our cells are constructed and operate. We're, of course, in the eukaryotic category because we can take advantage of that Many of the uh, antibiotic drugs, for example, that we take when we're infected with bacteria exploit those differences between us and them. So that's a key reason why we're going to be covering all these bacterial cell parts now because it is medically significant as we move through the course. We're going to be referring back to these things over and over. And of course, you guys are going to be seeing some of this information as well as you do your uh, homework activities and especially those uh, uh, Learn Smart Lab activities as part of your homework. One thing I want to uh, draw your attention to here on this diagram, that and that big kind of light blue blob there in the center, all of that right in there, that is a eukaryotic cheek cell. I'm presuming it's this kind of cheek, probably from a, uh, it's pretty easy if you swab the inside of your mouth, you peel off some of the epithelial cells that line, line the inside of the cheek pretty easily. So that's like one of your cheek cells. And that's probably the nucleus of that cell that's stained a little bit darker. But if you look closely, all these little specks you see all over the place, those are bacteria that are covering that uh, human cheek cell. And so the, the purpose of that figure is to show you the typical difference in size between a prokaryotic bacterial cell and a, a, a typical human epithelial cell. So uh, bacteria are generally much smaller. All right, so prokaryotes are unicellular. However, they can live in chains and clusters. So you can have individual cells that, uh, as those cells are dividing, they stay attached to each other, either in chains or clusters. Sometimes they stay together in pairs or quads. And uh, we'll be learning some of the terminology for that. But each individual uh, cell is one individual bacterial uh, organism. Now these are some pictures here. You can see some of the diversity in, in shapes. Some other key characteristics of bacteria, asexual reproduction. That means you don't have males and females. They don't mate to reproduce. One cell divides into two, uh, the very small cells that I just mentioned. And then also, another thing that I want to hammer home with you guys the vast majority are not pathogens. The vast majority do not cause disease. Remember, a pathogen is a microorganism that can make us sick. And so we get exposed to bacteria all day long. 
as we're walking around, everything's coated with them. You're breathing them in all the time. You're drinking them. You're eating them. And the vast majority of them do not make you sick. Your immune system wipes them out from the minute they enter your body. Um, however, we tend to focus in on the minority of bacteria that are capable of making us sick. All right, and bacteria can have different shapes, and you guys are going to be seeing that as, as you move through your virtual lab activities. These are some uh, spherical-shaped bacteria. And in this picture, you've got some rod-shaped bacteria. Uh, those are actually salmonella bacteria, the type of bacteria that cause sometimes intestinal inflammation problems. And you guys are going to be learning some of the terminology for these different cell shapes and so forth. All right, so we just said most bacteria do not make us sick, but what are some example bacterial species that are pathogens? There's a whole bunch of them, and I've just got a list over here of some common ones, and I'll, you know, let's run through them. Staphylococcus aureus causes, when you, when you hear about a staph infection, that is the, Staphylococcus is a genus of bacteria. There are a number of different species in that genus. Many of them are are generally harmless. Uh, your skin is covered with Staphylococcus bacteria, but this one species, Staphylococcus aureus, is capable of causing a number of different types of infections. Streptococcus is another genus of bacteria which has some pathogenic members. Streptococcus pyogenes causes strep throat. It's also responsible for scarlet fever, rheumatic fever. It can cause, there's some strains of it that cause flesh-eating disease. Um, also, toxic shock syndrome, if you've heard of that before, uh, that is generally caused by Streptococcus pyogenes. Salmonella enterica, which we just mentioned, causes the intestinal disease commonly known as salmonellosis. Bordetella pertussis, have you heard of that one before? Pertussis is another name for whooping cough. That's a bacterial disease which was generally gone from the United States, but since we have a uh, Quite a few people around who are not getting their kids vaccinated for it. It's um, it has been making a comeback. Mycobacterium tuberculosis. We'll talk about the Mycobacterium genus quite a bit this semester, um, and this obviously causes the disease TB. Listeria monocytogenes is another organism. It's like I've got that spelled misspelled there. That should be monocytogenes. I've got myocytogenes. I just noticed that. I'll have to correct it. Uh, causes a disease known as listeriosis and uh, now that you've heard about that it comes up in the news pretty frequently in fact just a couple of months ago or last month there was a listeria uh, contamination of bluebell ice cream and a lot of our bluebell ice cream got taken off of the market the clostridium genus uh, these are common environmental bacteria they live in the soil but um, they also have some pathogenic members clostridium perfringens causes gangrene and clostridium difficile is also known as C. diff which is a big time problem in healthcare nursing home settings it causes a, a diarrhea that's very difficult to to get rid of and then good old Escherichia or Escherichia coli E. coli uh, everybody's got that in your colon it generally does nice things for you but there are some pathogenic strains of it as well alright this this picture over here is an image of somebody who has a Staph aureus infection of the skin. So you can have Staph aureus on your skin and it's not causing you a problem, but if your skin gets cut open, the bacteria can invade down into deeper tissues and cause a pretty nasty infection. Whenever you see pus on a, on a, a skin lesion or even on a lesion inside the body somewhere, pus is generally a sign of a bacterial infection. Other types of microorganisms don't generally result in, in pus formation. All right, so here's a little bit more information about the different shapes of bacterial cells. You'll be covering this during your lab activities as well. Uh, bacteria that are longer than they are wide are rod-shaped, and the term for that is bacillus round bacteria like you see here, coccus. By the way, the plural of bacillus is bacilli with an I on the end, and the plural of coccus is cocci with an I on the end. So it just, uh, you know, if you're talking about one cell, it's a bacillus. If you're talking about more than one, it's bacilli. And finally, a spiral-shaped bacterial cell like you see here can be called a spirillum 
spirilla with an A on the end is the plural of that form. And then like I was just mentioning, sometimes bacteria can live together in chains or clusters. It's, uh, those types of things differ for different species. All right, here's a figure from your textbook, which if you've done your reading, you've already seen a lot of this information. Um, but going over what we call bacterial cell morphology, and you're going to be covering this in your online lab activities. But morph refers to structure. Uh, so cell morphology, what's what it's the shape? When it, we're talking about bacterial cell morphology, it's shape. And then also arrangement. Okay, and by shape, is it a bacillus? Is it a coccus? Is it a spirillum? Arrangement means do the cells stay together in a particular pattern as they divide. So many bacteria don't have, all bacteria have some kind of shape, but not all bacteria have an arrangement. And when, so when you describe the morphology of bacterial cells, you tend to put those things together. All right, so for example, like they're showing us over here on this diagram, um, some bacteria divide in just one plane, which means, you know, as one cell divides into two, as you keep creating more than one cell, all of the cells are staying attached with each other in one direction. And so there, uh, those tend to form arrangements where you'll have pairs. If that happens, that's called a diplo arrangement. And so if you have a diplo of round shaped cells, you can call those diplo coccus. And then uh, this term strepto means chain. So a chain of round shaped cells would be a strepto coccus. If you had a chain of rod shaped cells, they would be a strepto bacillus. Now you don't typically see chains of spiral shaped cells. All right, sometimes you can have division in two perpendicular planes. So as your cells divide, they may remain attached in that direction and then also in that direction. And in that case, they can form little packages of cells, uh, including fours that are tetrads, or if they form kind of a cube-shaped structure, that's known as a sarcina. And those can be up to 64 cells in, in size. And you see those with some coccus-shaped bacteria, not all. And finally, some uh, bacteria will divide and remain attached in multiple pl planes, and those are called staphylo. That's a staphylo arrangement when they form clusters. And you see that with coccus-shaped bacteria. So a staphylo arrangement occurs with staphylococcus type types of bacteria. And then also another um, group of bacteria, the micrococci, form those types of clusters. So you're going to hear that terminology. If you're around a clinical microbiology lab, you're going to hear people working in that lab talking about that patient had a streptococcus. That patient is infected with a staphylococcus when we looked at it under the microscope. So you are, it's a good thing to uh, learn that terminology and what it means because you are going to hear it if you're around a clinical microbiology laboratory. This is a figure from your textbook which is showing us kind of a generic bacterial cell and just keep in mind this is a generic kind of all-encompassing bacterial cell and so not all bacteria have all of the features that you see here so you're going to want to pay close attention as we go through these different bacterial cell parts. I mean, for example, the little green appendage there that is a flagellum which is a structure that rotates and allows a bacterial cell to move around. Not all bacteria have that. These little things up here that look like uh, blades of grass sprouting off, off of the top of the cell, those are called fembrii or fembrii is another pronunciation for that. And again, not all bacteria have those. The ones that do, they tend to help the bacteria stick to a surface. And you'll also notice multiple layers here at the surface of the bacterial cell. Not all bacteria have all of those layers. And so you know, we're going to talk about many of those differences and in fact we'll spend most of the time um, discussing the surface of a bacterial cell because that's where a lot of the key differences occur between different types and also if you think about the surface of a bacterial cell that's what's guarding against 
drugs or disinfectants or antiseptics being able to go inside the bacterial cells and inhibit them if we need to inhibit them. Uh, it's also what your immune system typically sees, the surface of the bacterial cell. So that tends to be the, uh, the most critical part when we're thinking about bacteria from a medical type standpoint. This is a pretty good overview from your textbook, um, which is just showing you if you take a prokaryotic cell, and I really want to change that to bacterial cell because bacteria are not the only are, um, are not the only prokaryotes. The archaea are also in the prokaryotic category, but they have some differences. Um, and as of right now, there aren't any archaea that are known to be especially clinically important, so we're not really going to spend a lot of time in this class talking about archaea. So I want to uh, emphasize here that we're really focusing in on bacteria here in, in Chapter 3. So we're going to talk about these different structures uh, that exist on a generic bacterial cell. So some of those are external structures, which means they protrude from the surface. Then we have our cell envelope, and the cell envelope is all of these important layers at the at the surface, and so we'll talk about how those differ from one organism to another. And then finally we have some internal structures, which we'll talk about as well. All right, so that's uh, it for the first video lecture for Chapter 3. In the next one, we'll talk about those external structures of bacteria that are protruding off of the off of the surface.